All right, everybody, welcome back uh, to our uh, Dan Attrell, the modern hermeticist, and I's uh, continued commentary on uh, on this um, 14th century condemnation of sorcery from the University of Paris. And uh, again, I think Dan said this in his last comment, but thank you guys for coming and hanging out with us on a random afternoon for us to talk about 14th century legal codes. I guess it's the sorcery part that probably is bringing you out more than the legal code part. If we were reading the Decretum, I'm pretty sure no one would be here. Yeah, or charters or anything yeah, like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but again, if uh, just to say, if folks haven't uh, uh, gone over to uh, the Modern Hermeticist, uh, Dan Trail's YouTube channel, definitely check it out. Um, yeah, give, go check it out. Uh, go take a look at his Patreon, support this guy's work. Um, I, I can guarantee you that the work we do is not easy. <laughs> And um, it sometimes can involve like hours and hours of reading strange 17th century books about how to magically learn things. So, um, well, Dan, welcome back. Thanks. <laughs> uh, I, I, I've been working on a recording of the Ars Notoria, which you should probably have hopefully next week, maybe the week afterwards, shoehorns nicely into our discussion. But I've been, I, I'm just recovering from COVID and I'm, like getting hoarse just reading all of this stuff so hopefully uh i'm not struck dumb like the people in the ars notoria who read it wrong are. all right like uh what's his name uh the guy that read it wrong and had that terrible vision and and he, he uh made the the libra visionum or whatever the yeah the sanitized version uh Rob, robert morinry or something like that Oh, Moringy. yeah Moringy. yeah he, yeah uh, the libra visionum version claire fangers guy that's right. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Um, all right. Well, I guess without much ado, if you haven't seen the first one, this is going to be very confusing, but uh, we're going to jump right in. <laughs> so uh, Proposition 15, do you want to take it up, Dan? All right. You want to put the slides up? Oh, did I not? Oh, yeah, you're right. This matters. <clears throat> all right. Oh, there we go. There we go. All right, Dan, take it away. Okay. So... Uh, decimus quintus, quod possibile es per tales artes cogere liberum hominis arbitrium ad voluntatem seu desiderium alterius. Error. Et hoc conari facere est impium et nefarium. So, the 15th, <laughs> that such arts can force free will of a person to bend the will or desire of another person. This is an error. And to try to do this is impious and nefarious. Um, so there's no shortage of magic that operates by manipulating the will of others, particularly the what we would call love magic. I don't know. What's the is there like a modern, more correct term for love magic? I call it erotic binding magic. Okay. Erotic binding. That sounds it also sounds kind of euphemistic, but yeah. <laughs> I suppose that that will do. Yeah. Um, you know, do such and such a ritual. Uh, with uh, images that bind the, you know, that put uh, two figures together and a woman will come to you and, you know, not or not be able to sleep, not be able to eat, um, these kinds of things until she comes to you and, and becomes yours, essentially. So, you know, to me, this is as deplorable today as it was, uh, as it was 600 years ago, but that's not the only category of, of bending the will of people uh, in magic. There's also making people give you money or making people uh, be favorable towards you or changing the opinion of a king or a noble towards you. These are common ritual aims. Um, and the idea here is that uh, it's impious and nefarious because you should not try to manipulate the will of other people. Um, it's just a form of of coercion and coercion is wrong um i mean it's not it's not very complicated yeah and i would say this is a you know, obviously a, this is the one that i totally agree with uh the rest of them i'm not sure if, you know i'm on board theologically with or whatever but the idea of of yeah like love magic just seems like the most i don't know there's something there's a, a dreadful kind of thing of basically torturing people into loving you or, or deprive or uh, manipulating their will in such a way that they can't not. And when we say love, right, it almost is always having them to have sex with you. It, it never, yeah. it's very well, rarely. You. Yeah. Um, so this is very like, I don't know, gross magic, but yeah. Um, 
and also I think in general, like the idea of taking away someone's free will, um, this goes right up against Christianity. Christianity really insists on the idea that we have a free will. It's a pretty classic, well, with the exception of Calvinists. Um, and uh, the idea of, of <laughs> uh, uh, the tulip folks in the crowd, um, with, with the exception of, uh, of, uh, of Calvinism, free will is really, really important in preserving it. It's going to be a, um, it's going to be really important, but yeah, it's the, fu it's fundamental to salvation. So you're really, me you're messing with the mechanism by which salvation is achieved. Yeah. And, it, and also I think it gets you into, in a, into a kind of like weird theological bind where let's say that fornication is a sin. I'm going to go with that. Um, yeah. so let's say that's a sin. And so let's say that you erotically bind someone to come fornicate with you. Well, or is that person responsible for the sin they've committed? And, and you get all kinds of weird problems where, you know, what, how does God judge people and, and things like that. So, yeah, um, no. And even Descartes has to preserve free will and does you know, jump through a lot of hoops to do it. And so that one's pretty obvious, I think. I, I think that's, you know, why they have this little addendum here. Not only is it an error, but it is impious and nefarious. Yep. Yeah, uh, but it is interesting that I, I wonder if uh, impium and nefarium, I wonder if those are technical juridical terms. I wonder if you could see that in the decretum or something, if there are Possibly. specific sins that are impious and nefarious. I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I can mean, easily imagine that being a stock phrase. Yeah, impious is, you know, not following the duties that are incumbent upon you, religious duties, and then nefas, for the, which is the word that nefarium comes from, mm -hmm is just not by divine will because right. fas is by divine will nefas is not by divine will divine will and so uh you know you're going against the will of god right is i think fundamentally the idea here right yeah it's actually contorting someone's will all right so don't do love magic it's, it's evil and cringe um 16th that uh, that for that reason, the aforesaid arts are good and from God, and that it's permissible to practice them. For through their observance sometimes or often come about that which the observers seek or say, because good sometimes comes from them. This is an error. Um, I think this one's the idea, again, you can't do the wrong thing for the right reasons. So just because you could cure someone through using magic, uh, you're, it's not right to cure them using demonic influence or something. And the idea is that you should just basically stick with God and pray if you want to have people cured. So just because good things happen because you do bad things, if I rob a bank and get money and then spend that money at charity, it doesn't mean that I've accrued any uh, goodness to myself because it's come through. It's come from a bad will or through a bad action. There's no Robin Hooding, uh, theological Robin Hooding here. Um, also, the idea that uh, that you can that this stuff comes from God. Uh, the idea is that of course it doesn't. God forbids it, and to argue that it comes from God and produces good. Uh, is um, is simply incorrect, um, and again, this is where you get the really the the where the people have to toe the line with things like John D and uh, Agrippa. It's like, and I think even Facino to some degree is like, how to what degree is this stuff really coming uh, is of a divine origin, and would God really tell you to would God really send angels to tell you to swap your wife, even though marriage is a sacrament? Um, and you can get a clear, pretty clear idea that maybe they're not dealing with angels or. Uh, God would not command angels to tell you things like that. So I guess these are probably, probably demons. And this is challenging also a common place that you find in a lot of magical books, especially in the introduction where it's almost describing the mechanism by which this magical worldview operates, where they're saying, look, all magic comes from God and and God set up the universe in such a way that you can in, you can uh, encounter certain um, divine beings or spirits or what have you that are subordinate and set over certain things. And so you're never really um, worshiping demons. I mean, some people do, obviously, but the idea is most people who do this stuff thinking they're being pious uh, do so within the context of you're getting God to make the angels or the demons do such and such a thing rather than compelling the demons directly. And so that's, I would say you have that, for example, in the Picatrix, where mm -hmm. uh, God or Allah, depending on which version you're reading, <laughs> is in charge. And all of the spirits and, and all that, they only act through, the, uh, through God's permission. 
And so it's always important to beseech God in your operations. Right. Yeah. I think it gives, again, it's good. It, from this perspective, it gives a lie to the idea of so-called white magic. That just like, no, that's not a thing. Um, so yeah, they're not going to be on board with any kind of magic. Although again, again, natural magic, it begins to blur the line about what exactly is going on there. And also just, it's just an interesting conversation to be had. If you've ever got the chance to read, uh, uh, Giovanni de la Porta's Natural Magic. It, it, it's a really fascinating text. It really shows you that the line between natural magic and early science, it's just how uh, po how uh, porous that boundary really was, which is a, it's a fantastic text if you've never had the chance to read it. Uh, sometimes it sounds straightforwardly like a scientific text, although pre-Baconian, uh, pre-Galilean in some ways, but and sometimes it's like, yeah, and here's also how to turn invisible, <laughs> um, which is very convenient. All right. All right. 17th. Okay. Decim, uh, decimus septimus. Quad per tales artes daimones veraciter coguntur et compeluntur et non potius ita se cogi fingunt ad seducendos homines. Error. So, the 17th, that such arts truly force and compel demons and not vice versa, that is, that the demons pretend that they are forced to seduce men, this is an error. So um, this kind of just builds off what we were just talking about, that uh, the idea in many magic texts that were floating around in this time period and still today uh, is that the demons are compelled to do things by the authority of God. And so this is, again, reiterating that this is an error and that it is men being um, deceived into serving them and m making their access into this world more, uh, more, I don't know, more manifest, if you will. Right. It's, tra it's straight from Augustine, right? It's exactly Augustine's argument that the, the demons only pretend to be compelled in order to trick people into doing stuff so they'll lead them into perdition. Yeah. Um, and again, um, <laughs> book nine of Augustine's City of God, we cited this last session and you could almost cite this as a, a, a confer with this book on almost every one of these points because he's very exhaustive in in his commentary yep 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 um and also yeah it, it is just interesting that uh, again how magic is supposed to work especially this medieval ceremonial magic that it is interesting that that people did believe that they could compel these incredibly powerful creatures to do what they wanted you know these you know, banal things like finding them treasure, getting them hooked up with someone or memorizing a bunch of stuff. Um, it is a, it is the height of hubris at some level too. And I guess that's the foul story and everything else, right? That, that you think you think you're in control at some level, but you certainly aren't. So I wanted to, to ask you here, I, I, I was reading through the comments yesterday. Um, I mean, I'm not reading them right now, but, uh, and, and people seem kind of set a jar by the idea that Solomon erred in what he was doing, that this is not, that it was not like a righteous thing necessarily when Solomon was dealing with demons. Do you have any thoughts on that? I, I think that these guys have just said that's just a bunch of made up legends and that didn't happen. Okay. I mean, I, I'm fairly, I mean, it's interesting because I mean, the one thing that you do see in the canon law and in the witch hunter manuals, like Malleus, uh, is that they just say, yeah, people say that Solomon did all this stuff and they claim all these books, but Solomon didn't write any of that stuff. All that stuff is just made up nonsense. And so I think that the argument is that Solomon just built the temple the good old fashioned way. That's, you know, he didn't use a Shamir or whatever, or if he did, I guess they didn't know about that. But that the idea that he compelled demons and stuff like that, I think was, I think people recognized it as apocrypha, at least learned people recognized it as apocrypha and did not take it seriously in, in the middle ages. I think there's also a misconception that people like Solomon and David were perfect. And mm -hmm. it's very clear that they make mistakes and are punished by God for those mistakes. Um, and I think a lot of people ignore that fact. They think right. like they, they are some sort of divine exemplar that we are to emulate in all things. And I don't really, I don't see that myself. Oh, for sure. I mean, David wasn't allowed to build the temple because of all the bad things he'd, he'd done. And the Testament of Solomon itself, right, the very end of it, no one reads that part. It says, and all this stuff led to Solomon being a, a reprobate idolater. 
uh, and that the end he was left with nothing. And that's why he wrote uh, Ecclesiastes, you know, lamenting the fact that he had you know, wasted his life and with all this and the wisdom he had accru accrued was this all, all of this uh, vanity, of this, uh, vanity. And it was, it was all, and, and I think that's more, you know, grist for the mill that either it's all apocryphal and none of that stuff really happened. And they made these stories up or they did do it and they later renounced it. And uh, basically what you're reading is a cautionary tale, not something that should inspire you to become a, a you know, necromancer yourself. Yeah. So I think that that was just worth mentioning that, mm -hmm. We, we needn't necessarily look at Solomon as a as a divine exemplar for how we ought to act, because I don't think that it was a very popular uh, point of view. No, definitely not. I mean, I think he's I mean, he's 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 meant to show that no matter how much wealth, wisdom and wealth you will you accrue, that none of that means anything and that Solomon wasted his life, basically. So. Yeah, sad guy. Right. Wrote the best book in the Bible, though, so. Oh, Kohelet, Ecclesiastes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's. I think it may be one of the best books ever. Like I love uh, during the holiday of Sukkot, we traditionally read uh, Ecclesiastes sitting in the sukkah, which is like this sort of little hut that you build. And there's just my favorite thing to do during the entire Jewish year is sit in this little hut that barely protects you from the elements and like read the the vanity of vanities. Um, I'd love to do my own translation of that book. I have ideas that I'd I'd love I'd love to translate it myself because I think it's such a cool book. Mm -hmm. But one day, maybe um, this Hevel is such a great word in Hebrew. All right. All right. The 18th. Uh, this is a longer one. So that such arts and irreligious rites, lots, charms and conjurings of demons, mockeries and other malefices in the service of demons never produce any any effect. This is also an error. For God does sometime permit such things to happen, as was obvious in the magicians of Pharaoh and several other places, either because the practitioners or the devotees have been given over to reprobate understandings for their bad faith and other terrible sins and deserve to be deceived. So this is an interesting one, and this is going to matter a lot, for instance, when you get to the Malus Maleficarum, because one of the things that uh, Institor is going to argue is that disbelief in witchcraft is also disbelief in Christianity, because one must believe in the reality of um, uh, of all this stuff, because it is actually uh, not only is it, is it tested in the Bible, for instance, in the uh, the uh, the Khartoumé, the sorcerers that Pharaoh had, uh, or the Baladov, the witch at Endor, but also right that these things are proof uh, that God does allow people to get sucked into this stuff, basically as punishment. And um, you see that this is interesting um, that. Um, I talked about this in my episode on De Lamais, where um, Molitor has to accept that God does allow um, a witches to like cause crop failure. Like they're not causing it, they're doing things, and demons are actually uh, causing it or indirectly causing it by they can see storms coming from far out, and then they can say, "Oh yeah, if you do this on a certain day, then the, the you know hail will ruin their crops." And it just so happens that they confuse correlation and causation. Um, but one of the things that's interesting about Molitor is he says, why does God let people do this? And he says, well, basically to punish them, that if they're already kind of given over to sin, um, let them dig the hole deeper and that let them get involved with uh, with uh, demons and things like that. Um, but it's also interesting. Molitor says, um, why why does he got to let this happen to good people, like decent people? And um, the answer there, of course, is that it will strengthen your faith because if you see a demon ruin your crops and you know there must be a God, um, which I just, I love that as an example. If you see something sufficiently bad done by a demon, then you must believe that there's a God. Um, uh, the Kind of the Job moment, I think. Um, but again, I think this, this argument is that um, disbelief in this stuff is also sinful. So you have to believe in it, but you're not allowed to do it. And that's mm -hmm. a crucial distinction. And of course, right, this is what you get in the Middle Ages all the time with Michael Scott and Chekhov Descoli. And um, these guys are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't do any of this stuff. I just read a lot about it. I just have all these books to understand what's going on, but I never do any of it. And that's their defense. It's like, hey, it's something sinful about reading this stuff. And, and even Thomas Aquinas and those guys, uh, William of Avernia and these guys admit that, yeah, I've read all these books. I don't do any of it, but I've read them. Um, and then you wonder, one wonders, wink, wink, nod, nod. Um, yeah, you can yeah. never know. Yeah, you can never know. 
Um, <clears throat> but uh, so, so another thing to add to this is that, I mean, the people in the 14th century were not hyper literalists like people would become uh, 200 years later, let's say, but they still honored the literal meaning of scripture. Mm -hmm. And if God forbids a thing, why would he forbid a thing that isn't real? Right. Um, if, if, if it's mentioned in the Bible, then why would it be mentioned in the Bible if it was not a real thing? So that that's an approach that the schoolmen would definitely take where they would say, look, it would be to violate the literal sense of scripture if we were to say that these things don't exist at all. Right. And this is, I think, I think this is riffing on the prohibition on magic in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy uh, where you get that long list of all the things you're not allowed to do. And in, and in English and Greek, it's relatively clear what those things are. You know, Sue saying and conjuring and blah, blah, blah. I'll just point out that in the Hebrew, it's far from clear what any of those words actually we mean. There's no agreement. Uh, there's no agreement rabbinically what they mean. And there's no agreement um, cultural, linguistically. We don't know what a maonin was. We just, we, something to do with clouds. But we know the word there is cloud. And we know that the ma means it's in a verbal form. So it's someone who does cloud something. So mm -hmm. it may have been some divination by clouds, but whatever a maonin is or um it's like or, the capnobatai in greek which is the cloud walkers yeah um, which is a kind of shamanic technique i suppose it could have been yeah 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 or the you know uh, menachesh like what is a menachesh the word nachash is in there snake so they did something with snakes but you know it gets translated in english as like soothsayer and clairvoyant but it doesn't mean any of that whatever it means it doesn't mean that yeah so but anyway, they're riffing on that. That's this is where this long list of things is coming from. I'm fairly confident it's from uh, the prohibition there at, uh, at Deuteronomy. All right, nineteen. All right, uh, the nineteenth. So the I'll, good. I'll, oh, I'll read it out the Latin. No, okay. Okay, so decimus nonus quod boni angeli includantur in lapidibus et consecrent imagines vel vestimenta aut alia faciant quae in istis artibus continentur, error et blasphemia. So that good angels may be confined within stones, and that they consecrate images or vestments, or do other things included in these arts, is an error. Um, so now we're not talking only about demons, we're talking about the good angels, who are common, uh, make a common appearance in magical texts. And uh, in this case, we're talking specifically about drawing them down into talismans or talismanic objects like stones or clothing or things like that. And uh, they are saying that uh, this doesn't happen, that if you are invoking angels into stones, um, then you are actually just dealing with demons because God doesn't, uh, there are no instructions in the Bible, let's say, for bringing angels into stones, as far as I know. No, although I mean there are stone objects in the Bible used for divination, like the Urim and Thummim, but those those don't that doesn't exist anymore and doesn't work anymore. Um, it's interesting here that we get the first mention of vestments. Um, this is also telling us really clearly we're in ceremonial magic and Solomonic magic specifically, but um, but also in Picatrix too. There's vestments of various kinds that one has to wear, made of all kinds of you know, lion skins and things like that that are very elaborate, which will come up soon. Actually, yep. yep. Um, it's interesting you didn't translate and blasphemy here. He just left it at error. Oh, you're right. Yeah, and there's a there's a little mistake there. Yeah, um, but error. it's important. It's, yeah, it's it's blasphemy too. Um, so make sure we had separate errors and blasphemies. And it is I, I don't see anything that's just blasphemy in this list. Did you remember? Do you remember one? No, I don't think that's their primary aim. I right. think their primary aim is to ward people away from heresy, which right. is obstinate error. Right. Um, you're not just a heretic for believing the wrong thing. You're believe you're a heretic if you believe the wrong thing. You are corrected by someone, and then you continue to believe what you believe in spite of somebody saying, "Look, that's not how it works, or how we believe that this works." Um, so this is really a document set set people straight. Um, and right. you're a heretic if you continue to do these things. Right. And this is public. This is published publicly, right? I imagine this was sort of the kind of thing that was you know, that was written up um, and then, you know, read out loud in classrooms at, at Paris. Uh, I imagine students were all rounded up and said, oh, yeah, this is the, the, the sorcery condemnation we've all been w waiting for. 
And they read this aloud to them, probably, I imagine. Yeah, or posted, you know, like uh, Martin Luther posting his 95 theses. That was not an uncommon practice to post things up for maybe not on the door, but uh, on a kind of bulletin board for everybody to read things that are posted. Right. And challenge people to debates and stuff. Like to put up contrary positions and challenge people to debates. Um, And I guess also maybe the case that logically all blasphemies are also errors, but... um, I'm not sure logically those co- they may correlate. Um, I'll let you take this one because this one uh, this one has a, a uh, uh, yeah mistake a in mistake it. yeah um, yeah so all mistake. right so the Latin is vicesimus quod sanguis upupai well hoedi well alterius animalis where well pergamenum virgineum where corium leonus leonis et similia habeant eff- efficaciam ad cog- Cogendos, well repellendos, daimones, ministerio huius modi artium, error. So uh, we have the blood of a little girl in the Levac translation, which is not what upupai is. That's a hoopoo, which is a bird that you will find in all kinds of magical texts. Like those hoopoos, they're like the civet cats. They just did not get a break in the Middle Ages. People love killing them for all kinds of different magical reasons. And uh, so that's what this is, the blood of a hoopoo. And a, and a little hint that um, gives you that this is not a little girl, but a, but a bird, is that later it says, well, alterius animalis, or another animal. Right. Um, so that's just a, a clue there that this is a list of animals. So uh, the blood of a little girl, or of a hoopoo, rather, uh, or of a goat, or of another animal, or a lambskin, which is how Levac translates this, but this is virgin parchment. So, I mean, parchment is made with animal skin, but the idea here is that the parchment is not um, written on. Uh, And then we have the pelt of a lion. So you often get lion skin belts and things like that in in many different ritual operations. Uh, And other such things have the power to attract or repel demons by the exercise of such arts, this is an error. Um, so this is more taking a direct head-on approach to some of the ritual prescriptions that are laid out in in books like Picatrix or uh, Ars Notoria. Or I mean, uh, are there sacrifices in Ars Notoria? No, no, no. I remember. The, no. The, no, the, sac- the Ars Notoria is really, really tame. All things told, I think it was written in a Christian. I think it was written in the University of Paris, frankly, yeah. or somewhere around there. I think it's. At, yeah, I think it's roughly contemporary to the 13th century. Yeah, it's attributed um, to Apollonius as the author, right. but yeah, so there's a ton of Arabic magic as well. Right. Yeah. I mean, and yeah. I think it, um, yeah, I think it's uh, it's uh, from that time period, but um, but yeah, I think that, and also this is the uh, you know Calavicula Solomonis literature. There's just tons of that literature, and it all involves. I mean, you can see pictures of what McGregor Matthews and those guys all dressed up with like lion pelts and stuff because they. Um, well, the real question is where in the hell do they get a lion's pelt? And I think 14... we know. Oh, oh, in the 1400s. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, in the 1400s. Yeah, I know where the I know where the British were getting them. Um, uh, but I wonder in in you know in, in 14th century France is is anyone importing lion pelts? I don't know. There were lions in Europe until I don't exactly know when. I think probably antiquity they still had them, um, and uh, they were probably driven extinct. I mean, wolves were driven extinct in Europe around this time period because they were just such a threat, or perceived to be a threat. Oh well, they were actually a threat. I mean, they were recorded for snatching up children and sieging cities and stuff like that. Um. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder if anyone uh, again. I think again. I think this may just be the kinds of things that they're. The, these guys are looking at a magical manual, right? Like they have, you know. Again, I think this is another thing we should point out is that a lot of people tend to believe that um, the church burned books at this time, and they did sometimes. They were and they were pretty famous when they did get burned, like the Dominican burning of the Talmud and things like that. Those are we know about them because they were so unusual. The the Inquisition typically did not burn books. They used books as archives and as evidence for trials. And so a good bit of this material would have survived, and this would have been in libraries. And so I think that the, the Magisters of, of uh, the University of Paris had access to all this literature. And I think they're just basically going through and saying, hey, you can't do X, Y, and Z because they see X, Y, and Z in all these, uh, in all these books. 
Yeah, and libraries were not like they are today, where you can just get a card and go and get it, uh, whatever book you want to find. You actually need to talk to the guy who runs the library and knows where everything is. And often these kinds of works were um, bound into other books that were like generic astronomy books or herbals or uh, lapidaries. They're, they're books that if, if you stumbled across a magical book that was within another book, um, it was almost like it was defanged in a way, or perhaps it was less likely to be found. And not only that, but they would, you know, if you got a book, you could read it, but it would be chained to a desk right. because people would steal books because they cost so much uh, to make and, and you could sell them at a very high price. And so there was a lot of, it was high security getting to these books. And, yeah, and you'd also be often locked in a cell with it. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, you can go in there. But uh, you're locked in there, locked in there with it. You're not, uh, it, yeah, you're, this is not like a, you know, library now or, you know, yeah, nothing like that. Chain libraries are really cool. I, have you ever been to one, Dan? Like, no, I there, haven't. There, there, there's a couple left uh, and they are just really, sometimes you see books on the market that come from chain libraries and they still have the chain on them, which is just somehow putting a chain on the book just makes it the most metal thing ever. You can take the most boring book otherwise, the, you know, the, the cretum or the sentences of Peter Lombard and change it to something. And all of a sudden there's something inherently magical about it. So were they specially bound in a way that there was metal running along the spine? Yeah, spine or... yeah. Yeah. You had to, you would have to cut the book away from the spine in order to do that. And also these chained books, they would be chained to a shelf and then there'd be a, a bench in front of them. And the bench would be, there would be no sitting room. You would stand while you read it. And, um, and again, like you said, you're not walking into a library off the street. You would be vetted in, and there'd be a librarian who was, you know, part his his staff would be part librarian, part security guards, and so they're they're looking over your shoulder the whole time. I mean, some rare book libraries are like that. I mean, the you I've definitely been in rare book libraries where I'm in a room with a guy with a nine millimeter. <laughs> He's just like, you're not walking out of here. Yeah. Um, so yeah, people don't really realize now that we take books for granted because you can get them for three dollars or whatever. But um, even relatively brief books back in the day. Um, they could cost a year's wages. Yeah, uh, a really good book on this subject, if you're interested, is called Magic in the Cloister mm -hmm. by Sophie Page. And it's all about this stuff. She studied at the, I think it's St. Augustine's Library. And um, it was the largest library in Europe. It was 2000 volumes, which is hilarious. It's not very big. Uh, and eventually it wound up in John Dee's library. Mm -hmm. So it became the foundation of his library. So. Uh, a very fascinating history of that collection of books. And I recommend anybody interested in this subject to go read Sophie Page's Magic in the Cloister. It is a great book. And Dee's library ended up in the Cottonian uh, collection and the Cottonian manuscript became the backbone for the British library. Mm -hmm. So it's funny like these, and of course a lot of Dee's books are also the ones they got from uh, looting, the, looting the cloisters uh, after they were all uh, destroyed. All right, you want to move on to 21? Sure. Yeah, I can. I guess I can do it. Uh, the 21st, that images made of bronze, lead, or gold, or white, or red wax, or other material, when baptized or exercised and consecrated, rather, execrated, as prescribed by these the same arts, these have tremendous powers on days, those, those days of the years described in the books of such arts. This is an error in faith, in natural philosophy, and in true astronomy. So uh, I'll let you take the the pseudo Dionysius. Um, yeah, note. sure. Yeah. So first off, this is clearly Picatrix or similar books of astral magic. So we're talking about ritual timing and specific images that are described in Picatrix, like images made of precious metals or lead or or wax images or even paper, um, and that you do these at certain times. Uh, specifically uh, depending on what the astral configurations are. And they're saying this is an error. And it's not only an error in the faith, it's an error in natural philosophy, that this is not how the planetary bodies function. Um, and, it, and then it says it's an error in true astronomy. And what is meant here by astro astronomia vera, that's a, a, 
a way of a coded way of saying the heavenly hierarchies of Dionysius. Uh, so Dionysius the Areopagite, he he wrote not only well he wrote about the super celestial world. So in this cosmology, we have the terrestrial world, then we have the celestial world, which is where all of the planets and the stars are, and and that's where this magic is tapping into, and then you have this third layer above everything. So this would be like the what Agrippa's third book of occult philosophy deals with. And that is true astronomy. The idea is that there is an even higher level above the celestial world that is the super celestial world. And that is where the real divine power lies. So if you are, are trying to draw on divine power from the, the celestial world, you are mistaken because um, it's it's not the optimal way to to get your blessings, if you will. Right. Um, yeah, and also I think that I mean they're also just going to say that the planets don't like I, I I'm fairly confident Thomas rejects Alkindi's theory of the rays. Like I don't think that they're living in a pseudo li Alkindi. Hmm? Yeah, pseudo Alkindi. Alkindi. Yeah. <laughs> so says that French guy uh, or French person. But uh, yeah, yeah, I, 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 yeah I, I tend to agree with his argument. Oh, wow, this is really started coming down. I tend to agree. I don't think that that it doesn't. I don't think it's Alkindi, but um, I think he makes a compelling argument um, that, that that's not really Alkindi. But whoever wrote uh, on the stellar rays, um, the the mechanism that they're using to understand the world by the 14th century is a very Aristotelian mechanism where you have this system of crystalline spheres that are being pushed by a by the unmoved mover, i.e. God. And the movement of the spheres is a, is a completely natural phenomenon. There's nothing, there, there's no like emanatory angels pushing things around anymore. And so the mechanism is much more Ptolemaic, much more Aristotelian. And I think by the 14th century, even by the middle of the 13th century, um, that, that they're just rejected the idea that, that there are these spiritual intelligences up there moving things around. And so I think that the idea also is that um, the only way for there to get to, the only way for there to be uh, bronze or lead or gold infused with planetary magical stuff is if there's something like the stellar rays operating and they've just rejected that as part of natural philosophy. So it's also just, I think, uh, a shift in the way that since the introduction of Aristotle beginning in the what, early, you know, early uh, 13th century, that they've just rejected a much more plate, a much more platonic vision of what's going on in the upper worlds. Yeah, like a populated cosmos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the population of the cosmos has definitely dropped with Aristotle. Um, I mean, it's amazing, Maimonides, I mean, he just really just guts the universe. You go from dozens and dozens of angels to like, there are literally nine. That's it. There are nine angels, no more, no less. Um, and I think that uh, insofar as Maimonides is on that train, I think Thomas probably was too. They're much, significantly fewer. And, and I think of someone like Pico della Mirandola who wrote extensively against astrology. Mm -hmm. And he one of his big arguments was actually a humanist argument as to why um, works like all, all of the pseudo-Aristotelian works were not truly by Aristotle. Because he says, look, if we go back to all of the works of Plato and Aristotle, those works, there's no mention of astrology in them. Right. And so all of this stuff must be a later development. Right. Yep. And I think that's, I think they're closer to the bone here in many ways to the actual reading of Aristotle than what gets introduced later that becomes very popular. Um, it's amazing that people really did believe all that stuff, theology of Aristotle and all that was the Libre de Calcis that um, it must have just been, been a moment in the 15th century where they just kind of blinked their eyes and realized that's not Aristotle. <laughs> I think a lot of people were sus along the way. Yeah, and, they were. And, and like Maimonides. Oh, Maimonides uh, definitely I was. Definitely was aware that like the Diber al Istimachis, which is one of the pseudo Aristotelian Hermetica, he's like, these are attributed to Aristotle, but there's no way that it's Aristotle. And I actually think that Pico probably got this idea, if not directly from Maimonides, then secondhand from Maimonides. Mm. Yeah, I mean, even just read some of them. I mean, like read things like the Libra de Calcis, and you're like, um, also, I think we read Aristotle now totally differently. If you take a, a, a even an undergraduate level class in Plato and Aristotle, you read him completely differently than the ancients did. Um, 
even what we read is not what the ancients read. Like Mm -hmm. no one's reading the Alcibiades anymore. And that's what everyone read back then. Mm -hmm. Um, So, all right. So we'll get too far afield. Okay, uh, vicesimus secundus, quod uti talibus et fidem dare non sit idolatria et infidelitas, error, uh, the 22nd, that it is not idolatry and infidelity or unfaithfulness to practice such arts and believe in them. This is an error. <laughs> uh, this one's pretty self-evident. I don't know. This It's like, no, this is idolatry, and even just believing in them is idolatry. And it's weird that they even need to say this one. It's like they're trying to cover all their bases or be very thorough. Right. It It is odd that they, you know, that they felt the need to, I mean, this is basically the summary one for the whole thing, but I guess whatever. Yeah. Uh, they, they didn't have great editors back then. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, uh, and there was no, the you know, redundancy was no, no mistake for them. Right. Right. Um, all right. So that one's relatively self, uh, self, uh, should be self-apparent. Uh, the 23rd, that some demons are good demons. Uh, others are omniscient. Still others, neither saved nor damned. This is an error. Um, I think this is just a pretty straightforward idea that, um, one, that there are no good demons. Demons are always bad. Uh, again, this is not the world of daemones in the Greek sense. Uh, that, that, that ship has sailed. So uh, there are no neutral daemones anymore. Spirits are either uh, good or damned, uh, that none of them are omniscient. Uh, that is uniquely, of course, uh, the purview of God. It's interesting that this one's not just also an error and blasphemy. It seems like believing that a, a trait proper to God could also be proper of a demon would not also be constitutive of blasphemy. Although I don't know, I, you know no, omniscience is not just propria for God. It is, in fact... Uh, yeah. one of the yeah, necessary conditions. It's not just a, a one of the propria. Um, and still others are neither saved nor damned. No, they're all damned. Yeah. So, And th- this one also, I think, refers right back to Augustine, mm-hmm. uh, City of God, Book 9, um, mm-hmm. for whom there still was very much this uh, idea of, you know, daimones is simply spirits, and there are spirits of various orders, so in his cosmology, even the gods of the pagans, it's not that they don't exist. It's that they are spirits and they are not the highest god. So they're not gods. They're they're daimones. The, there are other ranks in this cosmology, like heroes, which are exalted souls. And uh, they're not quite human. But they're not quite gods or daimones either. Right. Yeah. And I think that... Um... Yeah, I mean that he's still living in a very Roman context. I think by now, um, yeah, I, I would say. I mean, some it was aside from people reading Augustine, I can't imagine anyone in the any scholastic is thinking to themselves they really are spirits of Zeus, and they're just gonna say no, there's they're demons that act like Zeus or whatever. But Zeus is not really real. Um, but that, yeah, well, that one's a hard one. That one's difficult. Because if you read Ficino's yes. three books on life, for example, he's clearly right. talking about the Greek gods, and he's not. But I think they were more in demons. vogue then. Yeah. yeah, I think they were. They had come back into vogue then. I wonder in the Scholastic period, like I can't. I'm trying to think in Summa Contra Gentiles because I think Thomas talks about other spirits, other creatures there. But yeah, I don't think that he. I don't think the Europe, I mean, maybe the Europeans are dealing with different categories of spirits, like in Paracelsus, you have all these weird spirits that he deals with. And I mean, maybe some of the more like indigenous European gods that are still being talked about maybe really early on, like by the, um, in the canon Episcopi and stuff. But Mm -hmm. I think they just, I mean, I, my, if I remember back to the canon Episcopi, they just say, no, Diana's not really a real thing. It's just a demon pretending to be Diana. Yeah. There's not really these people were just systematically wrong. Which is just... And then I think of something like the Arbital, which has right. the Olympic spirits, which are not the Olympic gods. They are the subordinate to the Olympic gods. Mm-hmm. But it uh, it kind of contradicts itself in places about right. where the uh, translator or the author stands on on that issue. So I think I think it's complicated. And it, I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all answer. You'd have to go from author to author or person to person to to get people um to get the opinion on it 
Yeah, it would be interesting to to know, like, to go back to some of these guys and see what where they put these beings if they were uh, simply non beings with demons pretending to be them, or they were still somehow actually existent beings in the world. Um, yeah, because I know Judaism just says they're not really real. Yeah, they just they were just never real to begin with, or that Zeus is sort of a debased version of Yahweh or something like that. But they weren't really real at all. Um, but I, yeah, I'd be interested interested to see where like. In Sum the Summa Contra Gentiles, where Thomas puts them, if anywhere. Um, all right. Any more on that one? Um, no, I think that we it's pretty straightforward. I mean, do you know any texts that, that claim that demons are omniscient? No, but I think that if I remember correctly, this goes back to Augustine Book 9, where mm -hmm. it is discussed, uh, like, why would you go and... Um, appeal to a demon for knowledge let's say who doesn't know everything uh whereas you could appeal to god who does right yeah i mean yeah i mean also i think that i'm thinking of those sections where like like in in molitor and delamia right where they the demons just know a bunch of stuff and they're just old and they've just learned this stuff because they're really old or they can fly up really high so they can see very far away and they, they kind of know what's coming so they have like pseudo predictive power but no real predictive power but yeah um it is interesting yeah, that's when definitely something that that gets discussed is that they they have knowledge but it's not uh it's deceptive knowledge right. it's it's not used towards constructive ends right which is interesting because that's very different in for instance judaism where the shadim uh demons in judaism actually can see behind the veil the parochet where god is and they can actually listen to what's going on back there. And you can like use them as a, like a spy to learn what's happening. Um, there's a famous case of this where one of the most famous heretics in Judaism, uh, Elisha bin Abuya, uh, made the argument that there's no reason for him to repent of anything because he's already heard from behind the veil that he's damned. And so there's no, you know, the, the jury's already hung him. So there's no reason to re repent. So I like the idea that you can like, uh, for some reason, I always imagine like kids like sneaking their, head through like a, a curtain and seeing what's going on in the throne room of God. So, um, but they're not, certainly not omniscient, but they're, uh, but they're, they're knowledgeable. And they have real knowledge as opposed to, I think the false knowledge attributed to them in Christianity sometimes. All okay, right. So then we have 24. Yeah. 24th. Okay. We cassimum quartus quad suffumigationes quae, uh, Fiunt in huius modi operat operationibus with an upside down n, convertuntur in spiritus aut quod sint debitae eis error. So the twenty fourth, that the offerings of smoke performed in such activities turn into spirits, or that the smoke offerings are due to the same spirits. This is an error. Um, so this is, you know, the idea that incense is used in these kind of rituals and often it is used as a way to see the spirits in the smoke or in the incense that is a very common practice in magic um and i mean you can do it yourself and you will see it has very interesting effects or wondrous effects as we call them and uh this is uh this is not kosher um it is it is uh an error and so I don't know what more there is to say about this that we didn't discuss yesterday yeah. in the passage on therifications and um, suffumigations. But this, is again, is just a direct attack on um, books like the Picatrix, which rely very, very heavily on incense in the, in the rituals, I mean, especially think... as a medium through which the spirits act, right. because they are subtle beings that live in the, in the air. I think that maybe a text, and I'm, I'm wondering, it's a question of dating, that uh, the text that they might have in mind or a text that they they could have had in mind is the Ars Almadel, which is, a uh, uh, folks may know the Ars Almadel. I have an episode about it. It's sort of, it's like a portable shrine supported by candles which have holes drilled in it and you burn incense underneath it. And the incense goes, the incense smoke goes up through the, Ar, the Ars Almadel and it's uh, in, in the all drama that has all kinds of like magical symbols on top and angels can be summoned into that smoke. And so that's a pretty classic example of a 
of a, a mechanism by which one can um, summon angels um, using uh, incense. So, so here it's talking about demons, but I can imagine it could cut both ways that you could use this sort of portable shrine um, to do that, which is people are making it. Dan, do you know, you can buy like, uh, like an Almadel. Like the actual yeah. Book. I mean, Frank Klassen uh, uh, and David Pereka made, they 3d printed one and I just posted a link to it in the private chat here. I don't oh, know. that's hilarious. Maybe you could put it in the show notes or something. Yeah. Um, but they, you know, you have it set on four candles with this little plaque that kind of rests on the four candles and you pass the incense through it and stare at it. And it's very interesting. It gets, yeah. it gets real smoky in an enclosed space. If you were, if you were doing that ritual. Right. Yeah. And the, and you know, one can wonder, I'll, I'll post it in the, uh, in the, in the chat too. So folks can see it, but yeah, I've yeah, seen a couple of these, uh, some of these you can buy. I've kind of wanted to buy one. I, I always like, um, uh, What's the what's the the right word for it? I have like religious. There's a, there's some religious conundrums about whether or not I should own some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, sometimes I want to buy it just to have it because it'd be like a fun thing to have. But there's a there's a slight religious conundrum, so I might get one and then break it slightly. So that you could it own it and then give it to me, and I'll <laughs> hold on to it. You can hold in it. my cabinet of curiosities. No, but I want it in my cabinet of curiosities. <laughs> but I, I, uh, no, you'll own it though, so it's fun. or I'll yeah. own it. <laughs> It'll be yours. Yeah, yeah. I can. Uh, it's like the selling when in, in, uh, during Passover, where you sell all of your leaven to non-Jewish people. It's still in your house, but it, you don't own any of it. I'll um, be an Almadel goy. Yeah, <laughs> but I've wanted to buy one, but I'm like ah, because um, um, they do, they do, they they kind of look neat and yeah, and but, possibly etymologically related to the word mandala, which is yeah. a really fascinating that, thing about it. Yeah, I think so. I think that there, it's coming from from Sanskrit via Arabic, uh, mm -hmm. um, and there's cool Hebrew translations of it too, which is interesting, right? Considering I have a, I'm having a religious conundrum about ha owning one, and we, it's one of the texts that we, there's some good reason to believe that either really early on it was translated into Hebrew, or uh, it's sort of in that mixed Islamic Judeo um, um, magical environment. So, at any rate, go get an Amadel, burn your incense, see if you see an angel. Probably you will. It is an error, though. It is an error. You should know if you are if you are a Catholic person. I wonder if any of this has been retracted. Probably not. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's not like it's being issued from the papacy. It's just the faculty of Paris, right? So I don't know. Like, it, is what is what the faculty of Paris binds, is that bound at all levels of the church? Probably, probably not. not. Probably not. But I'm pretty sure if you were to take this to your local priest and ask, hey, can I do any of this? They're, they're not going to be like, yeah. Yeah. I can't imagine. I mean, it would, it'd be curious to know what the modern canon law is on stuff like this. Like, I wonder how recently that stuff has been updated. Um, but yeah. I mean, I do sometimes see announcements from the Vatican about things like yoga is bad. Because although for some people it's simple exercise, it can at some level become idolatry of the body. And it's so you get very similar uh, injunctions or prohibitions based on a similar logic that something becomes idolatry right. um, by focusing on it too much. Yeah. Yeah. I, it makes total sense. I mean, we still have the same thing in response to literature. I'd be curious to know. I mean, I haven't looked at work where the index of canon law is i'd be curious to see i mean you i imagine you're not going to use ours on model as like a legit catholic thing i'm pretty sure you would get in trouble uh but consult your local priest that'd be be curious to see what they say mm -hmm. you get a hip priest all right we're coming down to the end folks um all right the 25th that one demon is king of the east uh, and mainly by his merit, uh, another of the West, another of the North, another of the South. This is an error. Uh, this is just a common trope in ceremonial magic uh, that you have various kinds of demons um, that rule various uh, directions of the world. And by uh, orienting one's magical circle in various directions, one can appeal to those demons, demons of East being, as this text says. Again, this shows you they're reading this text. They know that that's a thing. And in fact, it is a thing. Um, and so the idea that there are these demons that rule, uh, in the various, uh, directions is, um, 
is an error. It's interesting also that it's an error, but not a blasphemy, considering you would think that this is sort of like fake kings or whatever. But, um, and again, it's amazing how persistent this idea is. Uh, you know, the watchtowers of the various directions and, and stuff like that is still a, a, a pretty recurrent theme in, in contemporary magic. Yeah, and the angels movie. of the four directions is fine. Right, right, right. Like, so they're, they're not saying there's an issue with that. Uh, of the four archangels, for example, that what they're saying is that that there are demons doing this is right. is not fine. And what what I find particularly fascinating about this document is that although things like Picatrix and the Solomonic tradition are different, they are different kinds of magic. Here, it's clear that the people writing this list are lumping them together, mm -hmm. and and. Pro, uh, prohibiting, maybe not lumping them together. There almost is a conscious separation between the types of magic, right? But that some aspect or uh, another of one type of magic or another is being forbidden. So I, I find that quite interesting. It, it, it shows that the people who are doing the forbidding are actually reading these texts, right? And, and not probably simply have a cartoon in their mind of of what's going on, right? And these are, yeah, like you said, these are very learned people. And I would, again, sometimes also one wonders, you know, you know, does thou protest too much? You know, like how much, how much do they know about this stuff? Uh, Cause it goes from being like really philosophical and abstract to being really specific all of a sudden. And again, one wonders to what degree uh, the Magister is sitting on the, uh, sitting on the bench writing this. Um, how many of them speak from experience? All right. I think the next two are going to get us into uh, some avaristic territory. I think this is some hangover stuff from 1277. Um, these are sort of the weirdest of the two in some ways, but I think they really are hangovers from uh, yeah, from the act of intellect and so yeah. forth. Yeah, I think it's just hangover from uh, the old av av avaroism struggles of the late 13th century, which are interesting because it seems like they're they're hanging on uh, even by the by the 14th at this point, which is interesting because you think that they would have made quick work of it by 1277, but apparently not. Nope. Still the number one sites for Ficino mm -hmm. um, writing against the Veroes. So uh, I'll just read it quickly uh, for those listening. Wicesimum uh, sextus quod intelligentia motrix coeli influit in animam rationalem sicut corpus coeli influit in corpus humanum error. So um, I think this is trying to say also that there is um, there is a physicalism that is acceptable. In the, and we, we were talking about this earlier, mm -hmm. this Aristotelian uh, physical cause, chain of causality is OK. But to say that there are intelligences that move the spheres um, is is not so like and that affect the way that your mind operates right. uh, it, because that is a, a violation of free will. Essentially, you can't have a functional free will if all of your thoughts and are being controlled by the movement of, of planetary bodies. Whereas it's obvious that, you know, the moon pulls on the tides or that the sun grows plants. Um, and that is a more physical causality in their mind than a mental causality. Right. And, You'll see, I think, Pico as well um, talk about this a lot, that no one denies that the planets have an effect in, on the physical, but whether they affect your emotions or your in intellect is another thing. Yeah, and also I think that one of the other worries about this whole business is that if it is the case that from God to you or whatever, or the angels as intermediaries or whatever, that if the if the active intellect or any intellects are flowing down, that might give you access to, you might be able to claim access to knowledge because your intellect is participating in a higher intellect. And I think the idea is no, it doesn't work like that. Um, and you can see this, you know, in Maimonides, uh, his theory of prophecy. You can see this, uh, which Christians did not like Maimonides' theory of prophecy, uh, and uh, in even a more radical way, um, Abulafia's theory of prophecy where you actually practice techniques to open up your active intellect, to, to bind, to bind your active intellect or bind your intellect with the active intellect and therefore gain the kind of access to the, to the divine mind. I think they're, they're wanting to prevent that kind of Neoplatinian, Abulafian, um, 
direct access to the divine. Because if you ha if you get that kind of direct access to the divine, well, why do you need a church? Why do you need an intermediary, right? And not to say there's not prophecy in in uh, the middle middle medieval Christian world. People like Hildegard of Bingen, obviously, but that's because God is directly giving her a prophecy. That's not because she's doing something on her own to like climb her mind through the spheres and get access to the active intellect. That 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 privileges her in a way that the Catholic Church is not going to allow. So I think that what they have in their sights here could be something like a kind of Abilafian um, epistemolo epistemology where your intellect and the active intellect can get down. And I think they're they're wanting to prohibit that. So the, I think you're right to say there's a free will uh, issue here, but I think it's also about the power of human agency to tap into um, celestial or super celestial intelligences, which by the way, if this one is an error, then Agrippa is done. Like that's the entire point of Agrippa's occult philosophy is to do this. Yeah. So and 26 is like puts the, insofar as it's, insofar as it is an error, I think this would, they could indict uh, the three books of occult philosophy on this ground. Uh, it's the sin of Satan as well, right? Yeah. He, he, he wanted to elevate himself to be like the most high, which is sort of like when you're trying to uh, climb up and learn everything there is to know so that your intellect can become perfected and become one with the active intellect. Mm -hmm. uh, that is not the way that you become united with God. God has to reach down. Um, and this is, I find you, you find a lot of this in Pico because Pico is trying to reconcile these traditions with Kabbalah. And he's mm -hmm. saying, look, uh, God extends his grace down and you have to, um, reach up you have to reach up and it's right. sort of like a, a beam of light that is comes from the sun causes um a steam to rise or vapor to rise and and you need to be able to be like the vapor and rise on like a stone that does not rise right yeah i mean yeah i think this is actually i mean i don't know about you dan but the the, the 26 and 27 to me are the most intellectually interesting the rest of these are like really clear straightforward condemnations of like hokey pokey ritual magic that everyone kind of knows about from the middle ages as much as people know about this stuff. But it's interesting that at the very end here, they tack on these much more philosophical um, condemnations, which again, uh, I think are hangovers from, from 1277. And um, maybe we should say something about that. So in 1277, there was a condemnation, one of several condemnations. There was one in 1220 and uh, the one in 1277 is the most famous. But what they condemned was a radical form of Aristotelianism that was inaugurated by uh, Ibn Rushd of Erois. And this form of radical Aristotel Aristotelianism denied things like the, it, it denied the temporality of the world. It said the world was eternal. It said that there was only one soul, the world soul, not individual souls. Uh, it said that God didn't know particulars, although that's not quite what the Averroes taught. But at any rate, there, there were these uh, very radical Averroistic positions that were being put forward. And you can go read the, the, the I don't know, it's a, a 200 or something, um, 200, 228 or something pr propositions that were condemned in 1277. And this really led to a big protest in the, in the University of Paris. Uh, several professors like Sigur Brabant were expelled. Uh, he does turn up in the paradise of Paradise Lost, just FYI. Hmm. Uh, yeah, Sigur Brabant is in paradise, which is interesting. Um, but at any rate, um, I think that these two are hangers on. They, they, they must be, uh, it must be aspects. Sorry, of do you mean Dante or Paradise Lost? Yeah, yeah, Dante. He's in Dante. Okay. He's in the paradise of Dante. Sorry. Um, I was like, because a Protestant, who cares what he thinks? Right, right, right. No, <laughs> it, it, it's in, uh, Sigur Brabant is in, uh, the, the paradise of Dante. Um, which was controversial, by the, by the way. Yeah, he was still, Seeger was still a very polarizing figure. Um, who is also just someone who doesn't, never gets talked about. Seeger of Brabant's uh, surviving texts on the eternality of the world are fascinating text. Um, yeah, that's the mother of all heresies, is the belief oh, yeah. in the eternity of the world. Yeah, you could, you could, I mean, if you wanted to get yourself killed, that was the quickest way to do it. And uh, Brabant really, Seeger Brabant really, and, and a lot of also in Thomas. He's actively arguing with that stuff constantly. But at any rate, these two are really about, I think, the, the Neoplatinian Averroistic um, metaphysics that are, they think, I think these guys are imagining are underwriting all of this, right? There's Alkindi and there's like this other stuff. And I think that they have to, uh, 
they have to uh, they have to knock these out. And I think by knocking these two things out, almost everything else falls as well. Yeah, though I think a big part of Pico's project is to kind of save this stuff and extricate it from the magic. And mm-hmm. and I think that Kabbalah is one of the ways where he does that, um, or he uses Kabbalah in order to show, like, look, there is an ancient mystical theology, and it is very much about uh, rising up to God and and becoming one with God. And and it is in Plato, and it is in Aristotle, but everybody now is reading a corrupt version of Aristotle and corrupt versions or corrupt interpretations of these philosophers. And so we need to readjust our understanding. And he didn't reject Averroism uh, because he was taught by um, Elia Dalmedigo, who was yeah. like the last uh, Averroist. Or the, he's called the last Jewish Averroist. I don't know right. if that's true, but that's his title. Right. And yeah, um, who has a very weird and cool. I'm going to do an episode about it. A, a cool critique of Kabbalah from this Averroistic standpoint. Or critique's a strong word, but a kind of he wants to correct Kabbalah and Averroism, which I find to be the most fascinating project. Yeah. And it's funny because he doesn't really like Kabbalah that much because he thinks people run with it and do right. crazy things. Um, but what Pico comes to say is that there's a guy named John of Jandun who is responsible for all of these misunderstandings and all of the schoolmen are following this guy. And this is why they're so angry at uh, these ideas because they've been misunderstood. So he's trying to fix that and and reconcile these problems without bringing magic into the picture. Right. Or if he does, he's saying that magic is the summit of natural philosophy right. and is yeah. not necessarily dealing with demons or anything like that. Or it's definitely not. I mean, yeah, what, well, yeah whatever. He calls that Goetia. Meant, yeah, right. Um, if folks are curious about this conversation, if you want to go uh, dig into this, um, if you want a book to read that really deals with this at length, that's really fascinating, is uh, uh, Ibn Rushd or Averroes' uh, commentary on Aristotle's De Anima which uh, I don't know about you, Dan, but I think it's probably one of the most important books of the Middle Ages that no one reads now. Yeah, because it's so hard to understand. Oh, it's so <laughs> difficult. And it's so long. Yeah. It's a brick. But um, um, I always tell people that if you want to get into how all of this works, you have to get into the commentaries on the active intellect and how the active intellect works. Because there is no Agrippa. There is no none of that. Um, the active intellect was a core philosophical component of the entirety of all of this. And it's a concept we no longer talk about and it no longer functions in contemporary philosophy at all, but it's really where it's really mined and polished is in, uh, Averroes's, uh, commentary on, on the De Anima, yeah, but it is you hard. Could, you could work your way backward through Ficino's platonic theology, where he's trying to tackle some of these ideas, but from a pl- uh, platonic point of view mm-hmm. and he's very much trying to undo what uh, Averroes is saying but that's one way of doing it is instead right. of just jumping into it you can work your way back through something slightly more familiar yeah 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 it's hard I mean I yeah, and there's no there's no denying it's one of the most difficult topics and I don't know about you but I've never found a really great book on the active intellect there's like a really great book about the active intellect and some Muslim thinkers Mm-hmm. But I've never seen sort of a definitive history of this concept. No, not that I, I know. I mean, I'm sure there is one, but I haven't read it. Uh, yeah. A lot of the stuff I get on the active intellect is through people like Abu Lafia. And, right. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah, I would just love to see an actual like straight up, uh, you know, definitive history of this idea. Because I do think it is um, much more important uh, than people than people realize. Maybe one uh, of the most important ideas in the Middle Ages. I think I've said it before on this show, but uh, reject Akashic Records, return to <laughs> active intellect. <laughs> I Yeah, or like the collective unconscious. Like the active yes. intellect is so much cooler of a concept. Yeah, you can uh, go there and become yeah. it and, yeah. and become Metatron. Yeah, commune with it. Yeah, and get transformed into a into an angel and see the future and become a fifth dimensional being or all kind of stuff. Yeah, the active intellect is, is the bee's knees. All right, Dan, you want to take us home? Uh, yeah, so just read this last one, 27. Yep, I think that's it. Okay, uh, vicesimus septimus, quad cogitationes nostrae intellectuales et volitiones 
volitiones nostrae interiores immediatae causantur a coelo et quad per aliquam traditione magicam tales possint sciri, et quad per ilam deis certitudinaliter judicare sit licitum error. So uh, that the heavens without any intermediary produces our intellectual thoughts and our interior intentions, and that such thoughts and intents can be known through some magical tradition, and that it is permissible to certify the pronouncements made in this way, this is an error. So we, you know, we've said much of what there is to be said about this, but it's an attack on astrology. It's an attack on hermetic perfect nature, for example, uh, which is a prominent feature of the Picatrix and um, part of this pseudo Aristotelian tradition. Uh, they are rejecting all of this stuff, and it is an error because, again, it violates free will, which is the cornerstone of the Christian faith, because you have to turn your will up to God, uh, who is the highest good, and that is the good, is to pursue the highest good. And to do anything else is a lack of good, and the lack of good is evil, because there is no ontological evil in this cosmology. There's no substance that is evil. It is simply a lack of God, like a hole in a garment. Mm -hmm. yep, the, priv the privatory theory of, of evil. I like this last phrase, right? That it is per, that it, and it, that it is permissible to certify the pronouncements made in this way, like that clearly, and this speaks to some kind of what it must have been some kind of magical prophetic tradition where people were divining things by accessing planetary spirits or something, and then other people were certifying they were true by doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. like, it's like double checking someone's chart. Yeah, it must be something like that. Um, but I'm, but what I'm trying to I'm thinking, I'm, what I'm trying to think, and maybe this is an astrological thing that they were doing, where they were, um, which is again like they're not totally pro or anti astrology. I mean, again, these are the same guys that are telling us that the Black Death is being caused by a conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn. Um, but I think it, I think there must have been some other kind of astral projection, to use a modern term, um, but they were communing with planetary spirits, which we know that was a thing that was being practiced in some of these magical traditions. And that it looks like there was some technique of certifying these pronouncements, i.e. Uh, like a prophetic check. Um, but I don't know of any, I, I can't, I can't think of any magical text that does that from the Middle Ages. Mm, yeah, the Picatrix is the closest thing where yeah. you can be visited by the servant of the moon, let's say, or visited by the spirit of perfect nature. Um, and that is all about knowing your, uh, like the specific rulers of your of your chart, right? And that's in and of itself is an extremely difficult thing to do, right? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, what an interesting idea. I mean, can you imagine? There's a bunch of like sixteen year olds, like in a Parisian dorm room, being like, "The spirit of Jupiter came to me," and like, "Really? Came to me too? What did he tell you?" Um, yeah. I mean, calculating the Lord of your nativity and all that is extremely difficult. I right. think that um, the astrology podcast with Chris Brennan, they have, I think, a, like a three hour special exploring all of the different sources that from antiquity um, that that people debated on how this was done. And right. there's clearly no consensus. So people come and ask me how to do it. And I'm like, look it's not straightforward and there are contradictions in the tradition. So I can't really tell you how you do it because you've got to pick someone's method and go with it. Right. And that's, yeah. it's also a part of the debate between um, Porphyry and Iambicus and on the De Mysteries, right. Whether it's possible to find this, this um, ruler or not. Right. Right. Yeah. Man, it's um, yeah. People forget just how complicated medieval astrology got. Um, or was, and it's like shocking how, uh, again, like that stuff is just now, uh, thanks to people like Chris Brennan and other people being sort of resurrected from the obscurity and just showing how incredibly complicated uh, all this stuff was. I mean, these guys, the, a lot of the guys working on this stuff in the Middle Ages were incredibly sharp. Mm -hmm. So, all right, last slide. Okay. All right. Take it away. No, is, it, is it the last one? No, no. We have we have this one and one more. All right, the 28th article. That such magical arts of any kind can lead us to a vision of the divine essence or to the spirit of the saints. 
this is an error. Uh, and lastly, these determinations have been enacted by us and our deputies after prolonged and frequent examination. I really do believe that. They've been agreed upon in our general congregation of Paris, called this morning, especially for this purpose of this church of uh, St. Mathurin. I wonder if that church is still there. Hmm. Be, I'm, sure. we're kind of, I'm going to kind of go on Google Earth and check it out and see if it's still there. On the 19th day of the month of September in the year of our Lord, 1398, we have witnessed the proceedings by the seal of the aforesaid faculty appended to these documents. Sadly, the seal's lost. I'd love to have seen that seal, the big wax seal, I'm sure. Um, I want to kind of see if that, um, there's a part of me wants to Google and see if that church is still there. But uh, I guess the last thing, right, that the magical arts of any kind can lead us to a vision of the divine, uh, divine essence or to the spirit of the saints. Um, again, I think this is a, like a pretty strong attack on things like uh, Ars Notoria. Yeah. And like that vision part is, I think, certainly part of that. Um, well, the, there's also, also a lot of verses in the Bible that say things like, if you if you enter into the kingdom through some other way than Christ, then you're like a thief breaking in in the night. Mm. Um, there's no other way. The path is laid out for us, and it is suffering. It is the path of self renunciation and laying down your life for your neighbor and loving others. That 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 is the merit that the saints acquire. That's what made them saints. Is that they they were able to overcome their basically self-centeredness or their selfishness and to become annihilated in Christ. And this is what they are saying, that this is the way to, to the kingdom and that you can't just magic your way into it. Can't you, can't, cheat. <laughs> you can't cheat. There's no game genie. There's no demons right. that will get you there that it's, it's only achieved through this, uh, this hard, long race. Um, and that is, I feel like the, the center of the gospel. And so there are a lot of messages that are uh, traditions that try to say that you can get to heaven and through other ways. And uh, they're saying, no, that there's only one way that the saints get into paradise. Yeah, Dan, but I think your, your Protestantism is, is, uh, is shining a little bit. Possibly. Because I, I'm pretty sure these guys will tell you that there, there's only one way and that's through the church. Right. Yeah, right. I mean, the church is the, the body the, of believers right but it's through the through the church and, the, and their sacraments yes uh and that if you persist in these errors they can deny you the sacraments and therefore you sure as hell aren't getting through the gates um so yeah i think it's that that it, it's um they're deeming this heresy because clearly these guys were trying to use magic to to short circuit uh what is by all rights bequeathed to you by the grace of god and they're saying no like there's no way to cheat. It's through the through faith in the church and through the sacraments that one is able to achieve these kinds of um, yeah. Those are the milestones magical feet for you, right? Um, and I think they would even say like, yeah, you want to do miracles, you can do miracles, sure. Like we do, people do miracles all the time, but they don't do them because they're putting angels in crystals or gems or seeing you know demons in smoke. Um, uh, so I think it's like an alternative vision, like, hey, you know, you, you can't short circuit this. And if you really want to have access to this kind of power, you can actually get access to this kind of power. Mm -hmm. um, so, but. All right. Any final thoughts? We covered all what all 28. Yeah. 28 mansions of the moon, 28 condemnations. <laughs> I wonder if there is, I mean I want I mean the middle ages they love number stuff so I wonder if there is a, a particular I wonder if it's 28 on, on purpose or 28 on accident because some of these are definitely redundant but I wonder yeah I don't know probably not yeah it would be an idol it would be a blasphemy and an error to, <laughs> to base it on the the pattern of the moon it'd be it'd be funny if it were in fact done that and it was a wink wink nod nod <laughs> we know that you know that we know um I'm sure someone will read it that way. They'll take the first let first and last letter of each paragraph and then string them together and add some vowels in and decode the secret message. Yeah, it really. If you find it, a secret message, please let us know in the comments. Yeah, definitely. It'd be funny if it were error. Um, <laughs> they knew you would go try and look for something like this or like the weird stuff. Like sometimes, uh, like you said, there's a, I think there's a couple upside down ends in here. Yes, uh, that's a common printer's mistake. Yeah, yeah. I just, where you're like, you're fiddling around with your little. Um, I don't know what it, what they're called. 
but the, the individual type. pieces, the typesets, and yeah. then you, you you slot it in and it flips over and you don't notice. And also, a lot it. of these are like a lot of these are are, are you can use ends and use and ends were in, were the same letter yes. in the type. You could yeah. like in Mario Brothers, where the clouds and the bushes are the exact same uh, thing. Yeah, you could just reuse them to save uh, to save on type. There's also oh. a lot of ends. So many ends used that they like if you come across a like a non and it's just N O with a dash over the O, then that's a, an N or an M afterwards. Right. I will say the one thing nice about this is that how unabbreviated it is. I'm so yes. used to like, I mean, printed stuff typically isn't terribly abbreviated, but I'm glad we're reading this in print and not in manuscript. Cause it would be dash, 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 dash. Every single M would be abbreviated and everything else. I mean, it's, yeah, it's not so bad. I transcribed the 700 page book of Archangelo of Borgonovo and you know, every third word is abbreviated and most of the abbreviations are fine, but some of them, I'm just like, I don't know what this is. I got to go look it up and it takes forever. Oh yeah. I, I did in, in worked in manuscripts for a while. I uh, unpacked a whole page of, uh, of CLM 849, the Necromancer's manual on an early episode of the channel. And I was just like, most of what I was doing is just unpacking <laughs> uh, abbreviations and nightmare. All right. Any last thoughts? We should go to these... our last slide just for the. Oh yeah, yeah. Should yeah. Sorry. There you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure in the in the crowd of folks in the chat, I bet an error has occurred. I bet. I mean, I, I imagine that there's no one in the chat not guilty of at least one of these. Yeah, and I uh, imagine most people are not terribly sympathetic towards these uh, these condemnations. But you know, I wouldn't expect anybody to be on a on a show called esoterica <laughs> yeah <laughs> team catholic team medieval catholics yeah um but yeah i guess what i guess the last thing i would say is that i really love texts like this just because they give a they give us a glimpse into the actual even if it's indirectly and by through negation into the actual magical practices of of the high middle ages where you know at some level we have some magical books from that time but actually not that many just a few a handful but this uh, text gives us one a clear instance that magic was being practiced in the university environment. It was being practiced to such a degree they had to publish a relatively extensive condemnation of it, and that we get some glimpse into what kinds of magics were at least predominating in the minds of the people engaging in this condemnation. And so, this is one of these great texts where um, we get a glimpse into the Middle Ages in a in a in a pretty neat way that I think otherwise we would have been lost. And so these condemnations give us a, 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 a glimpse into a world that would have otherwise, otherwise been lost to us. So it's a neat text in that way, even if you don't agree with it, I don't imagine many people would, but also I think another thing I will say is that um, what's also really cool about this text is unpacking it. And that's why I really wanted to do a commentary with you and I, is that you know we have a pretty good grasp of the kind of things going on at this time, and seeing just how much the the text is kind of the 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 tip of a of a much bigger cultural and intellectual theological milieu, and to know that these condemnations are not just sort of a bunch of like stodgy dudes being mean, that there are legit whether you accept them or not, there are legit rigorous intellectual, philosophical, spiritual, even moral concerns operating here. And that this text represents um, the iceberg effect, right? That we that the, the the condemnations are the tip of the iceberg, but really what's going on underneath it. And to me, what's really fascinating are all the other theological and philosophical um, and magical things going on underneath it that aren't immediately obvious if you don't have uh, you know people talking for whatever three hours about it. <laughs> Yeah, and I do love that we just decided to sit down and unpack a primary source. Or I suppose this is technically a secondary source in a way because it is a printed two hundred years later, but right. you know, close enough to primary source uh, and dealing with translation and all that. But unpacking things from the inside out instead of coming from the top down is a you know that's mostly what you see on the internet is people um, explaining things. Uh, rather than unpacking things. And mm -hmm. I think that that's, uh, this channel is great because it, it affords us the opportunity to do that. And uh, so I really uh, appreciate that and uh, have, have very much enjoyed it. Yeah, it's, I think it's a lot of fun. And also I think that just part of our love of like 
scholasticism. I, I don't know. I don't know about you, Dan, but I really, I feel like I really dislike the way that scholasticism is. That word has become like a dirty word. Yeah. Since the humanists. And that we think of like, you know, the, the Sco Scotsman, uh, the Scotman as like sort of dunces and all this stuff that I do think there's a lot to be gathered by doing commentaries. I think commentaries are a really important form of literature, both historically, but also I wish there were more of them now. And I think that this is a, I, I hope folks can see this maybe in the chat or folks who are watching to show that commentaries are not just uh, droll recitation of things, but they're actually unpacking what's going on between the lines, what's going on intellectually, and seeing that this is actually often more complicated than what's on the page. And so I think commentary literature is a, is a, is a sadly lost literature that was never really, res that, that lost respect. And I wish I could garner some of that respect back. And I, I think it's a, it's a noble, it's a noble form of literature. Yeah. And it's funny that people hate on scholasticism and then are the first to like quote Foucault in every single paper they write yeah. or, or always refer back to the same like five deconstructionists. Um, and it's like you're no better than they are <laughs> no 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 and, and yeah and it, it yeah and this sort of the orthodoxy that emerges even sort of like in the wild world of postmodernism, where you know yeah you have to name drop yeah if dominant. you write an article or a paper people will be like well you didn't cite this guy who is the authority on this so you didn't cite that guy which you know that's a legitimate criticism but it is very much a scholastic approach Right. Um, right. The, the whole scholastic method was this kind of sick at known method mm -hmm. where you have a question and then you have uh, you put a yes category and a no category. And then you put all of your yeses on one side and all of your no's on one side. And then you try to explore um, all of the points that are made. So, oh, yeah. No, I love the the disinquisition method. It's just I love reading Thomas for that effect. Like you know, because it, he's one of the things about scholasticism I think is really great is it takes seriously all of the different possible ways that you could be wrong, mm -hmm. and they lay out like, oh yeah, this is all the things that my opponent might say. This is why I don't agree with them. This is why I think that something else is true, and this is my argument, mm -hmm. and this is a position I land on. It's just a really rigorous way of. Of, uh, of thinking and taking up, um, you know, oppositional position seriously. I really don't think, I mean, again, I think that there's a, a, a lampooning of that technique and a lampooning of that thinking that happened later. Um, yeah, I the think humanists. Just, the humanists really laid into him for it. And it did get out of control. I it mean, did. Uh, there's no doubt and, about that. And it's boring. And and it doesn't it doesn't move men's hearts. And that is what the, the guys in the Renaissance were saying. They were like, look, this these systems, they're elaborate and they're interesting and all that, but they fail to rouse people to act within the faith. Right. And, and so we need to bring back those old texts, which had that rousing power um, to affect change in the world, because not everybody is going to sit down and, and read a hundred different six and a hundred different knowns and and try to balance out uh which one they want to which one they want to go with yeah yeah and, it, it, and again i think it the the humanists were right that it became decadent in that way that it mm -hmm. became very navel gazing and very decadent but i still think that that uh that a scholastic approach i mean i think we could learn a lot from doing things that way just from learning to like think through your arguments through negation like how might i be wrong what are my opponents mm -hmm. going to say uh, as opposed to the assumption of being correct and going from there. I mean, can you imagine how different French philosophy would look in the 20th century if they just asked like, oh yeah, this might sound completely crazy and here are reasons why this might not be true. But uh, it's interesting that they did not do that. Um, all right. Any other thoughts, Dan, before we wrap up? I don't think so. I think we were pretty thorough in our exploration. And uh, yeah, I think that... Uh, probably call it here yeah i think so unless there's some like burning questions or I yeah they're even like, monitoring the chat at all yeah I, I, i've only looked at it here and there sorry folks um are any questions on this text not a not as a general esoterica questions we'll do a maybe do another live stream esoterica q a but any specific uh questions about the text we can i don't know about you i have a little bit of time mm -hmm. i got time okay just to See if anyone has any thoughts or questions about this text.
I guess not. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and I guess another thing also I'll say before we wrap up is uh, I'm going to put a poll up um, on the channel here in just a little bit. And I just to get people's interest in whether or not they want to see more content like this, more um, more content in terms of commentary content, which is to say uh, people like Dan and I taking a primary text and then unpacking it um, in a live discussion. So um, I'm going to put a poll up about that because I don't know about you, Dan, but I really like doing this. I think it's a great way of engaging with text. And I think it'd be a great way for, for uh, us to take really complicated texts that maybe people are interested in and then really work through them slowly and uh, unpack them. I don't think we're going to work our way through like the entirety of, I don't know, the, the, the elements of theology or something, but maybe chunks of things, maybe like chunks of Deanima or something like that wh that are really important or maybe Proclus's text on sacrifice and theurgy or whatever, but smaller stuff. Yes. Um, yeah. But that would be um, a good text to look at. Yeah. It's a short one and it has all kinds of interesting things. So, uh, but yeah, I'll put a poll up and if, uh, you know, if folks are interested and I'm, I'm always down to do content like this because it's so enjoyable and I get to hang out with cool folks like y'all and Dan. And YouTube has also made it nice that they separated now live streams from the main videos, which is, so you have like shorts, live streams, and your main videos, each in three categories. So it kind of pushes creators to do more work in the live stream category without drowning out their actual content. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Although I don't want to do any shorts. I don't know. No, oh, no. Take it, yeah. yeah, you do the you do the opposite of shorts, Dan. You do longs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna right read. I'm gonna read a book for four hours. Marathon. Well, I've yeah, I've destroyed my voice trying to read the Ars Notoria. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're the you're the anti shorts. Um, um, there's a couple questions we can throw them up. Just uh, I don't know if we can. Let's see. I think this is more of a kabbalistic one, so I'm gonna grab that one. Um. How do demons interact after you've learned the knowledge from these texts? I think by getting you to do more demonic stuff in order to get you to further sin in order to get you to damn yourself. Yeah, there are different theories about this, whether demo, uh, like whether the demons are trying to make you transgress or make you uh, like embarrass you almost by making you do transgressive things like dabble in body parts or feces or what have you. Um, but that there are various opinions on that topic. I've, I've noticed that it's not settled at all. Right. But I think the idea is that once you open the door, right, like, and also one of the things we forget and we've not mentioned is that in, in medieval Catholic theology and now the Catholic theology, one of the main things that demons are wanting to do by getting you to dabble in all this occult stuff is to possess you. Like that's the, that, that it, op it basically opens the door for them to be able to do outrageous things with your body, to be an outrage against God or to lead you into perdition. So there's lots of mechanisms by which they're up to the various demonic shenanigans that they're up to, to, uh, to corrupt you and to outrage God in general. Mm -hmm. Hey, John, good to see you. Uh, yep. We talked about talismans uh, a couple times, a few times. So you may want to rewind. There's a couple of, uh, propositions about yeah, the talismans. proposition about wax, gold tablets and lead and so forth. I mean, the gist of it is it is an error and a blasphemy. <laughs> yeah. Um, let me see some other ones that are specific. Uh, let's see. Not quite sure. What I don't is. know if demons know that, you know, I think that is something no, that is often, don't. it is often said that they are not omniscient. Yeah. They and can't so, read your mind. For mm -hmm. sure not. Yeah, that would be a violation of your free will. Um, yeah, they can't. Uh, they can't. They can't read your mind. Hence, why you need these specific operations that 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 make it uh, easy for them to come into this world. I mean, they're already in this world. They're just invisible up there, flying around. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess this the brief. Let's say about this, right? That the big difference between. Kabbalistic theories of evil, which were just flourishing at this time and Catholic theories of evil, is that Catholic theories of evil typically are privatory theories of evil, which is to say that evil has no metaphysical existence on its own. It's a privation. Whereas in the Kabbalah, uh, at least in the Zohar, um, evil does have an actual existence. It is a it is an ontological fact about the it is an ontological fact about the way that the world came into being, and there's a kind of dross thrown off by the creation of the world 
and that uh, that byproduct is what we call evil. So for the Kabbalist, evil is a metaphysical fact. For Catholics, uh, evil is not. It is a privation. Yeah, and you know, there's the devil, but he is just an angel lacking in good. And so right. in his lack of good, all he wants is deception and lies and yeah. Right. Yeah. He's, Everything he, that is not good. Right. Yeah. He's, um, you know, he's just like throwing a cosmic tantrum. Which is why I never could get on team devil. I never understood people who are like into the devil. It just seems like a, 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 a big tattle, like a tantrum. Um, you know, he reminds me of like my two year old when my two year old, like, doesn't get the pacifier they want and they just throw themselves on the ground and bang their head against the floor and it's like screams out in agony i'm like i don't know i just never got the whole john milton the devil's romantic figure stuff i don't know like uh yeah all right um a couple more how much do you think this revolves around the author's belief in public incompetence that's an interesting one I mean, it's not saying that if you do it right, that it's okay. Um, that if you perform the rituals properly, then then everything's fine and good. I think that very much it's a damned endeavor from the get-go, from their perspective. Right. Uh, and also, I think it's actually presupposing the public's competence in this. This is a this this is a learned group of people writing to another learned group of people. This is not the Magisters of Paris writing to peasant women in the countryside. This is like doctors, some of the most high ranking intellectuals in the Western world, basically writing to their colleagues and students because no one else is going to read this. No one else could read. Yeah. Um, so, no, but they're they're all about um, this is this is very much being this is from the literati to the literati, assuming some significant degree of competence, magical competence, that is. You have a favorite demon, Dan? No, Yeah, I don't either. Um, I mean, I don't know what it means to have a favorite demon, like you, favorite appearance or favorite effects or. Yeah. I like Tritivulus. You ever heard of Tritivulus? He's the demon of misspellings and manuscripts. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. There, there's a great, there's, he's a medieval, he's an actual medieval demon. And there's a, you can see him like haunt the edges of the manuscripts and he was responsible for like scribal errors. I, I kind of do like Azazel and how complex his history is as the scapegoat and all of that and yeah, he'll devour it. you if you do kabbalah wrong right these kinds of things uh yeah yeah azazel is really interesting yeah um metatron metatron is an angel uh now which how he got to be an angel is a bit of a debate it's either I, enoch got transformed into him but sometimes uh, michael gets transformed into and metatron that and was he already in, there before Enoch transformed into him? Yeah, it's so weird. The the Metatron stuff. Super weird. Like we don't even know if it's a Greek word, which that's the a theory is like beside the throne. Right. I think but. that's probably what it means, but yeah. It's such a weird. And there's like him and Sandal Sandafalon who are these angels that have that appear in the Talmud and have these weird names that aren't Is that the that Sartor aren't. stuff? Uh, so it's an angel like he's just, he's sort of a Metatron like character that for whatever reason never got popular, but he's like Metatron in that he's some kind of meta angel somehow associated with 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 this two powers in heaven her heresy that existed sometime in the Second Temple period. But he's again he's just he never got the press I guess that he never had a good agent so he never got famous like Metatron did. Uh, all right, let's see if there's any other questions. So I wonder if by this time the cult of saints uh, were already on high and what was their position toward their use as part of some other cult ritual? So that's a good church history question. The cult of saints was definitely in full swing, but it was in full swing. It had been for a thousand years by this point. Right. Um, yeah. And it operates through the merit, right? The merit of the saint. And if you come into contact with, let's say, a saint's body part, then that some of that merit transfers on over to you. And that was a root of a lot of the indulgence system was right. that, that the Vatican had these giant stores of merit that they could dispense to other people. And you could do that by purchasing an indulgence. Um, and this is a big issue of the that Martin Luther has in his 95 theses where he writes the theses where he writes against this idea. 
Right. And it's abuse. I mean, this how Yeah, because they were draining all of the money out of Germany right. and sending it to Italy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, even the cult of Mary at this point, it, by the 13th century, it had already really gotten a big deal in Spain and had spread already to France and stuff like that. So, but. All right. Well, I think that's. Yeah, maybe we'll do that for, for questions. Um, yeah, so many weird angels and stuff. All right, folks. Well, uh, again, I guess I'll, I'll say this. Thanks to everyone in the, the chat who hung out with us uh, for, a, a, what, it's like three and a half hour long commentary uh, on 14, late 14th century text on uh, the condemnation of magic. So again, like I said, um, I'll put up a, a, a poll about whether or not folks want to see more of this kind of commentary with uh, with other folks. And uh, it'd be cool to look, you know, look through the, I don't know, the book of the law or some other relatively short texts and, um, and, and do that. So, but at any rate, I uh, just want to say thanks to everybody who hung out with us. Thanks to everybody who, you know, again, supports Esoterica for folks who support uh, Dan as well. Thank you for supporting him. Thanks that's for familiar. Oh yeah. Wow. That's very scary. Uh, <laughs> it's an error, Dan. I know. <laughs> Um, well, thank you again, everyone, and uh, I'll see you folks in a couple days for this episode on uh, on uh, Lilith, the first of at least two, probably three episodes on Lilith. So, um, so I'll see you folks in a couple days for that. But otherwise, uh, you guys take care of yourself, and see you soon. <laughs>